Okay, let's get started. Uh, dear colleagues and the friends, uh, welcome to the uh, session nine, uh, Oceans in the Anthropocene. My name is uh, Julian Chen. Uh, I'm a researcher at uh, uh, Green Innovation Hub Beijing, uh, our environmental think, think tank, and I will be starting my uh, PhD candidature in Macquarie University soon. So I want to thank the organizer for offering me this uh, opportunity to chair the ocean session because ocean is really uh, my topic. I have been working on it for more than 10 years. Uh, yesterday, there, has, uh, there was a fascinating session about uh, law responsibility and the biodiversity climate uh, society nexus. Uh, in this session, we will keep uh, exploring this session, uh, this, this topic, uh, but with a focus on the ocean. You can see on the agenda that we have a great group of speakers today, and I will, I'm really uh, looking forward to the uh, discussion. Uh, before we kick off, I have a few uh, reminders. First, uh, each speaker has uh, 15 minutes to present. I will be reminding you on the time. I have a timekeeper uh, in the chat box. Uh, when your time is up, I will ask you to conclude soon directly. Uh, please keep your presentations in time because we uh, really want to have uh, enough time for discussion. And for the audience, if you have questions, please type it in the Q&A box. Uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, after each presentation, I will check if there is any burning clarification questions in the Q&A box. If you think your question is a burning question, you can mark it as a burning question in the Q&A box. But in the discussion part, I will be asking questions uh, uh, from the Q&A box to the presenters. So when you ask questions, uh, you can also be specific on to whom your questions is directing to. Okay, with no further ado, uh, I would like to start our uh, presentations. So our first speaker is uh, Mr. Ethan Beringen. Uh, Ethan is a PhD student and a member of the Center for Environmental Law at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Uh, last year, he joined Macquarie University as a Master of Research student after completing his undergraduate study at the University of Adelaide. His research is focused on uh, international environmental law and the law of the sea. Specifically, he is uh, concentrating on the negotiation for a new instrument for conserving marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. His particular interest is uh, the intersection between poli the political science and the international lawmaking, as well as Australia's role within the negotiation paradigm. Today, he will speak about the three eras of Australian practice in marine protected areas, the, international, the interaction between national and the international law and policy. Uh, the presentation was pre prepared by him jointly with Neng Ye Liu and uh, Michelle Lin. So Ethan, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julian. I'll uh, um, just share my uh, slides with everyone. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Ethan. Um, uh, as uh, you know from the introduction, um, I'm a very new PhD candidate here at Macquarie. Um, I just finished my master's uh, at the end of last year. Um, and Nia and Michelle are my supervisors um, from the center as well. So you would have seen them around at the different um, presentations. Uh, so today I'm going to be uh, presenting a part of my master's research from last year, which is about um, Australia's marine protected area practice. Um, so we'll just get straight into it. Um, I think Australia is a really interesting country to study when it comes to um, MPAs or marine protected areas because um, they're very active in the space, um, but not necessarily as successful as they would uh, claim to be. So if we look on the left side of the slide, the national level, Australia is, um, has a very extensive MPA network. About 37% of its waters are covered by some kind of MPA, and you can see the different um, zoning on the bottom there. Um, but also internationally, Australia is very active. So um, a good example is in uh, Antarctica and the um, Kamala, which is the Antarctic um, marine protection body. Australia has actually been proposing a MPA uh, in East Antarctica along with France um, since 2012. Um, so Australia is interested in 
not just MPAs um, in its own waters, but also in um, international forums as well. Um, and not only is Australia very active, but Australia is also very vocal when it comes to its activity in this area. So here I've got um, three quotes from three different uh, politicians in three different decades uh, speaking Australia's credentials. So um, John Howard in 1998, uh, when Australia released the Oceans Policy, said that Australia was demonstrating their world leadership. Um, Tony Burke in 2012, the Environment Minister of the time, said Australia was leading the next step um, in uh, ocean protection. And then even as recently as last year, Susan Lace, the current Environment Minister, said that Australia has one of the world's largest representative systems of MPAs. Uh, so active and vocal, um, but uh, according to the literature, not necessarily effective. Um, so uh, here's just some examples of, of some assessments of Australia's practice um, from the literature. Um, de Villiers and others in 2015 wrote a very interesting um, piece where they analysed the spatial distribution of Australia's protected areas. And they basically came to the conclusion that um, they didn't align with threatened biodiversity, but actually were residual in that they aligned with, um, well, they, they avoided um, commercial areas of the ocean, so areas that was, were designated for fishing or oil and gas, um, these MPAs deliberately avoided. So they actually lost out in effectiveness in that way. Um, on the other hand, internationally, if we just look at Australia's East Antarctic proposal, it's been subject to a number of different critiques, um, especially that it uh, focuses more on Australia's historic sovereignty claims in the area, um, rather, and France as well, who were the co-proponents rather than um, specific ecological features, as well as um, Australia's fishing notably being um, removed from the area where it, it is proposing the MPA. So Australia actually has, and France as well, actually have um, sub-Antarctic islands uh, and exclusive fishing zones because of that. So they do most of their fishing in that area um, rather than in the area where they're proposing the MPA. So there's a little bit of a similar pattern there um, when it comes to critiquing Australia's practice. And so that led me to, um, to ask, well, if we have these similar critiques of national and international MPA laws um, that are made by Australia, why is there not much literature linking the two together? Um, and so the objectives of this part of the research was to try and theorize a link between these two levels, between Australia's national and international law um, when it comes to MPAs, and then um, see if we can use that as a framework and analyze Australia's um, history and, and its ongoing MPA practice. Um, and so briefly, this is the model that um, we came to. It's uh, um, based on international relations uh, middle power theory. And what it essentially argues is if we start at the top um, at the international level, that uh, upon the formation of an international MPA obligation, Australia could be expected to take enthusiastic action to implement and, and visibly implement um, this, this obligation um, in order to build a reputation as being a good um, actor in this area and then use that reputation to have more influence over the next stage of international law development when it comes to MPAs and the ocean uh, conservation more generally. So that was the theoretical framework. Um, the theory behind it is, uh, as I said, middle power theory. So I'll just briefly um, go through a couple of the aspects of that. Um, so the first one is the idea of good international citizen. It's a very common concept for middle powers. Oh, and I should just note that Australia is considered to be probably the prototypical middle power that a lot of the theory is based upon. So um, a middle power has a lot of various definitions, but um, it's generally just thought of as being less than a great power, but still having um, the resources to have influence. Um, and so one of the other things that used to be considered maybe definitional about middle powers was this idea that they were good international citizens, that they were co cooperative, followed international law, um, tried to, to put in place um, constructive norms. Um, but that has kind of fallen out of vogue. Um, most scholars now think that middle powers actually are no more, uh, uh, no more selfless than any other kind of state um, or self-interested. And instead, they've moved to this idea that this is a um, approach that middle power that uh, middle powers can take in order to gain a bit more influence to, to engage in diplomacy on the basis that they're co cooperative and constructive. Um, and uh, when we look at niche diplomacy, this is the idea that middle powers um, 
being somewhat limited, um, only focus on particular issues that they think they can actually have an impact in when it comes to international relations. And so um, Australia in particular has focused on ocean management um, a number of times internationally. And so when you put the two together, you end up with um, this concept uh, that Australia tries to build a reputation in a specific area like ocean management rather than in all areas um, in order to have a bit more influence when it comes to the negotiation of international law. Um, so having briefly touched on the theory, now we'll move on to looking at um, the periods of Australia's practice and how um, they conform with this theorised model. Um, just initially, don't worry too much about reading everything on this timeline. Um, it's just more a visual indication. So you can see um, the amount of, of things that occurred both on domestic and international side of key events and also some of the linkages between them. Um, I'm going to go through the highlights anyway. Um, so this first period, 1990 to 2000, um, I've characterized as being a momentum building period for Australia, if, if we're analyzing it through this model, um, from through the lens of this model. So, um, and we start here because of two key international instruments, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which were both ratified in the early 90s by Australia. And we see that Australia then implemented national policies of response. So um, of particular interest is the 1998 Oceans Policy, which is what John Howard was bragging about at the beginning of this um, presentation. Uh, and that uh, included these guidelines for establishing a national representative system of MPAs, which is what um, has shaped the current MPA system that Australia has. Um, but at that time, Australia hadn't done too much um, in its own waters except for these policies, and they had about 4% um, coverage of MPAs, um, and they hadn't tried to do anything internationally um, in particular. But moving on to 2001 to 2012, you can see the timeline's a lot more busy. Um, 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development in particular was a key event uh, for Australia as they were very involved specifically on coalition building when it came to ocean issues. Um, and one of the outcomes of this summit was a goal for representative networks of MPAs by 2012 globally. Um, and this goal was actually picked up um, by a number of other international forums uh, as this decade went on. So uh, the CBD uh, Conference of the Parties also um, aligned with this. So did CAMELA, the Antarctic body, um, and the IT targets reflected a similar goal. Um, meanwhile, Australia was working towards achieving this goal, which was also in line with its oceans policy. So 2007 and 2012, Australia implemented big swaths of MPAs. Um, and 2012 was also when Australia proposed the East Antarctic MPA. So again, we can see Australia um, being active internationally um, and then trying to live up to that, that international obligation and then trying to bring that back into the international sphere again with the Antarctic proposal. Um, and we can see again that Australia's coverage increased from 7% of its waters in 2002 to 36% in 2012. So this was a very active time um, for MPAs in Australia. Uh, but the most recent period um, from 2013 uh, highlighted a significant change. So there was actually a change of government in 2013, um, which hadn't been a problem with these previous uh, previous efforts for MPAs. But, um, this initiated a review of Australia's MPA network, which had just been announced. Um, and eventually it led to a downgrade in the protected status of a lot of the areas, but um, they were still designated as MPAs. So the, the percentage was still the same. Um, Australia also was less involved internationally. Its East Antarctic MPA proposal has still not been accepted, so it's been 10 years since they proposed it. Um, and their coverage stayed at this 36-37% uh, range. Um, and that looked like it until last year while I was doing this research, Australia announced um, that they were going to increase their, their domestic coverage again with a new set of MPAs in the Christmas and Cocos Killing Islands, which are Australian overseas territories, um, and that would increase their coverage to 45% of their waters. Um, so again, stagnation, but um, very recently, Australia's become more active. So to sum up all of that, um, how closely does Australia actually follow this model, um, this middle power theory model? Well, um, only completely for one of the three periods, that middle period, we can see the full range Australia um, engaging domestically and internationally, um, trying to use its, its expertise and influence 
um, on the international stage. But I would argue that 1990 um, to 2000 was also a period of build up towards that, that second period and it wouldn't have been possible without the foundation there. Um, the current period, 2013 to current, um, and it may be conceivable that this could be the start of a new period with the um, recent MPA announcement. Um, it had that stagnation, but then did return to um, domestic MPA creation again. Um, why, how could this be explained? Well, I thought possibly um, a reaction to international 30 by 30 movement, which is a, a goal for a global 30% MPA coverage by 2030. Um, and that's been driven especially by the United States. And while Australia already has more than that in its domestic waters, it may be possible that they're trying to stay ahead of the curve by increasing to 45%. Um, and the other possibility is uh, that Australia has some interest in international negotiations in this area. So um, particularly the high seas treaty negotiations or the um, BBNJ, um, which is looking at MPAs in the high seas to protect biodiversity. Um, so it's possible Australia has some designs um, in that area too. So to conclude, I'll just uh, list some kind of areas. Uh, this could be taken in future areas for future research on this uh, topic. So the first is, is obviously um, continuing analyzing Australia's practice. So um, at the next international discussions after they've implemented this new MPA, what do they do? Do they try to exert any influence or is it just a coincidence that they've decided this, to implement this new MPA? Um, another important point I think is that research is actually needed, which is probably not, um, I'm probably not capable of doing, but about the effectiveness of um, the Christmas and Cocos Killing Islands MPA, um, uh, because Australia, while it's kind of been skimmed over here, has a bit of a tendency to implement these MPAs for the visible aspect, but not necessarily um, very effectively. Um, and then the last point would just be, um, I think it would be interesting to take the model um, that we've uh, used to apply to MPAs and see how it might apply to a different issue, something like um, climate change, where Australia obviously um, doesn't seem to be pursuing a good reputation um, on that uh, particular topic. And so then do, does the model fall down or, or could it be explained in some way? Um, but that's all uh, from me. So thanks for listening um, and I'll give back the floor. Uh, thank you, Ethan. A very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, your presentation made me think of one a uh, fact about the East Antarctica MPA proposal. Uh, in the beginning, it was a representative system of seven separate MPAs then, uh, with no uh, debate negotiation on the in, in the commission meet, Kamala commission meeting. It they just feel that they guessed the, the position of uh, China and Russia, and they modified it and then uh, changed it to the a stepwise approach yeah the, yeah your, your presentation just made me think think of that and the, they just the priest bay mpa they just uh, deleted it because they think that uh, china may be uh, china doesn't like it uh, yeah that's something that we, we, we could uh, discuss later but yeah i see there's no uh, burning questions here we will move to uh, the, the next speaker our uh, next speaker is uh, Ms. Madeline Pierce. Uh, she, uh, she recently completed her uh, Master of Law at the uh, Victoria University of Wellington with a focus on oceans and environmental law. Uh, following a career as a solicitor in uh, education and two years to work in the international team as to, to, the, to the New Zealand uh, Ombudsman. Uh, she now works as a principal advisor uh, in the public service field at uh, Tekawa Matahu, the New Zealand's public service of uh, public service commission. She now works with public service commissioners in the Pacific to strengthen public service for the citizens. Uh, the topic of her presentation is uh, blue carbon mitigation opportunities for Aotearoa. Roa. Yeah, uh, Maddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hari mai, whakatou mai rā. Uh, welcome and thank you everyone uh, for sharing your work and for the opportunity to share mine. 
Uh, as noted by Julian, um, while I work in the good governance space, uh, my mouth has looked at two of my passions, uh, oceans and climate change. Um, so having heard the term blue carbon being thrown a around um, a lot in the climate change world, um, and with Aotearoa New Zealand having one of the largest EEZs and coastlines, um, in my research I wanted to know about the status of blue carbon in New Zealand um, and what could be done to better recognise it um, through policy solutions. But to start us off, um, I'll give a sort of brief overview of what uh, the scientists are saying about blue carbon and the opportunities um, it has in climate change mitigation. So climate change mitigation is primarily uh, focused on land-based mitigation at the moment. Um, and the roles of oceans um, is less mainstream, but this is changing. Um, ocean mitigation has been traversed in detail by three pretty big uh, global reports. IPCC in their 2019 special report on the ocean um, and the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy in their 2019 report, uh, the ocean is a solution to climate change and in the World Resources Institute report, uh, enhancing NDC's opportunities for ocean based climate action. Um, so all three of these reports recognize the potential of a range of ocean mitigation options um, as part of global, the global mitigation effort. Um, including blue carbon. I'll start off with um, sort of my definition and what I, I define blue carbon as for the purposes of my research. Um, I defined it quite broadly um, as biological carbon stored in marine ecosystems. So I focused on three uh, blue carbon mitigation options. The first, uh, protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems. The second, controlling um, seabed sediment disturbance, and the third, seaweed aquaculture. So I took quite a, a broad view on blue carbon um, and yeah, sort of looked at what New Zealand was doing um, in the space and how it related to our climate change policies and then sort of came up with some ideas around how we could be doing better. So I'll talk through each of these methods in a little bit more detail. Um, so firstly, protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems. Um, so coastal ecosystems play a really important role in the global carbon cycle. Uh, mangroves, salt marsh and seagrass ecosystems um, have strong mitigation potential due to their ability to transfer carbon um, and store them as marine sediment. And they also store carbon in the plant biomass. Um, so organic carbon in soil and sediment is uh, higher than most forest soils. And degradation of these habitats, um, for example, through land use change and pollution, um, can cause the release of carbon and other greenhouse gases. Um, mitigation of these ecosystems can be achieved by, um, through habitat protection and restoration. Um, but currently, there are some difficulties with quantifying the carbon stores and flows due to a lack of data. Um, the IPCC does have a wetland supplement to support um, countries to measure blue carbon emissions and removals. Um, and due to the other co-benefits of coastal ecosystems, um, for example, the, um, the benefits that they provide to the wider ecosystems, um, the IPCC notes that this form of mitigation is a no regrets mitigation option. Um, the second uh, type of blue carbon mitigation I looked at was uh, controlling seabed sediment disturbance. So uh, this sorry, uh, uh, Maddie, are you using a, the slides? Uh, no, uh, I'm not. I'm, okay. I'm not because using someone slides. is asking the chat box. Sorry, yeah, please carry on. It's all good. Sorry, not using slides. <laughs> You're just going to have to look at my face. <laughs> um, yeah, so controlling seabed sediment. Um, so this is sort of seabed sediment disturbance through dredging of the seafloor um, or seabed mining, and this can affect the um, carbon that's stored in the seabed. Um, in terms of mitigation, um, these activities can be managed um, through uh, managing activities such as seabed mining and uh, uh, deep seabed um, fishing. Um, and also through creating marine protection areas. And again, in 2019, the IPCC found that there is um, generally a lack of data um, to understand the carbon storage processes 
but this is changing. Um, there was a report that came out last year um, that highlighted um, seabed sediment disturbance through seabed trawling. Um, and this found that uh, seabed um, fishing activity um, can release up to 15 to 20% of CO2 um, that is annually absorbed by the ocean. So it, the impacts can be quite large. And then the third, third uh, seaweed aquaculture. Um, so large scale seaweed forests, if left undisturbed, are recognised as having the potential uh, to support blue carbon mitigation. Um, but again, more data needs to be collected to understand the potential of the carbon storage. So there are some uncertainties um, in these blue carbon methods, um, but knowledge is emerging and developing. And all three methods are recognised globally as having potential as part of a range of climate change mitigation. So now looking, I guess, at what New Zealand is doing um, in the blue carbon space. So currently, um, there's no standalone blue carbon policy in New Zealand. Pieces of policy uh, can be found sprinkled in different areas and managed by different regulators. Um, but blue carbon isn't linked to New Zealand's climate change policies currently. So my research uh, pieced together the patchwork um, of blue carbon policies to understand where we're at, where the gaps exist, um, and then make some recommendations for change. Um, so for context, New Zealand's climate change context, currently we have quite low climate change ambition, disappointingly. Um, the International Climate Action Tracker ranks New Zealand's domestic policies uh, and actions as highly insufficient. Um, but this is changing. Um, in 2019, New Zealand set up an independent climate change commission to provide advice to the government uh, to meet its climate change targets. And this first advice was released in June 2021. Um, and the government's re required to respond to this with an emissions reduction plan setting out its policies um, to meet its climate change goals. So the commission uh, found in its advice last year that current policies don't put New Zealand on track to meet its NDCs. Um, and it provo uh, proposed a wide range of different uh, policies and strategies for New Zealand to meet its emissions. In terms of blue carbon mitigation, the commission recommended that the government prevent loss um, of carbon from destruction of wetlands. So that was that first method I mentioned. However, beyond this, the Commission didn't make any recommendations about blue carbon mitigation. Um, in response, there were quite a number of public submissions um, calling for more attention on blue carbon, um, which the Commission recognised, um, but noted that they wouldn't be addressing it um, because more work needs to be done to understand and quantify blue carbon. Uh, so in my paper, um, I stated that the Commission engaged with blue carbon as an afterthought, um, but this isn't surprising. Uh, the Commission uh, was very much focused on the data that it has available today to reach New Zealand's climate change goals. However, um, at the very least, in my view, I thought the Commission could have highlighted the potential of blue carbon mitigation and the need to understand it better and link it to New Zealand's climate change policies. Um, so what, did, what could this look like? Um, I recommended uh, that New Zealand's upcoming emissions reduction plan um, provides an opportunity to include a wide range of mitigation options, including blue carbon mitigation. Um, and I said that the plan should include a blue carbon policy to link existing knowledge in New Zealand about blue carbon um, to New Zealand's climate change mitigation plans and to set future blue carbon objectives and strategies um, and enable research and development um, in the blue carbon space. And I said that this policy should be supported by appropriate resourcing um, to support the realization and growth of blue carbon mitigation in New Zealand. Um, so I said that this policy um, should focus on quantifying blue carbon for future inclusion in New Zealand's greenhouse gas inventory, and also take a precautious approach um, by protecting and enhancing um, certain blue car carbon environments now. Um, a blue carbon policy should also be supported by stronger oceans, aquaculture, and coastal policies that incorporate climate change considerations 
And currently New Zealand is, is pretty weak on these um, underlying policies. So the overarching uh, blue carbon policy within New Zealand's climate change um, regime um, should not duplicate work, um, but should connect the dots between a wide range of policies and regulations uh, to recognize synergies and enable blue carbon mitigation uh, to be understood and supported as part of New Zealand's wider climate change policies. Um, so I then went and looked at the different uh, pockets of blue, blue, blue carbon policies that exist in New Zealand and, and gaps that exist in each of these. Um, I found that um, some mitigation opportunities are being recognised um, by different government departments um, and pursued in small pockets, um, but that these aren't well connected and there's quite a lot of work to be done um, to improve the way that um, different blue carbon methods are being managed um, and then linked to climate change. So yeah, really it was about linking these blue carbon methods to our climate change policy. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of what New Zealand's doing in each of these spaces, as well as the research that's been done and recommendations made to sort of enhance um, each of these areas before I conclude. Um, so the first method, which is protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems. Um, so the agencies that regulate these environments already do recognise the climate change benefits um, of protecting and restoring these environments, which is great. Um, for example, the Department of Conservation recognises that um, seagrasses and mangroves are champions for sequestering carbon. Um, and they note that mangroves um, capture carbon four to ten times more than forests. Uh, they currently have a project to map mangro uh, mangrove and seagrass coastal areas, um, which is great. Um, but overall, the management of coastal ecosystems in New Zealand um, is quite fragmented. So it's spread across a, a wide range of regulators um, and different regulations and can be quite confusing um, for the different management entities. Um, this was recognised in 2020 um, by New Zealand's Independent Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, um, Simon Upton, who found that management of um, estuaries um, is, is fragmented. Um, there's a maze of different jurisdictions, responsibilities and policies that makes managing these areas um, very difficult. Um, so management requires improvement to enable better protection and monitoring in New Zealand, not just in pockets. And the Commissioner has already made a number of recommendations uh, to support this and to um, incorporate um, climate change values in these spaces as well. Um, so in my research, um, I supported this recommend, these recommendations by the um, independent commissioner um, and then further said that they should be then linked into an overall blue carbon policy. The second method, controlling seabed sediment disturbance. Um, so currently seabed sediment disturbance is not quantified extensively in New Zealand uh, and in terms of how much of our seabed is trawled, um, it's currently less than 10%. Um, approximately 30% of New Zealand's coastal area is uh, protected from seabed mining. Um, but the recent study on seabed trawling that uh, sort of highlighted the impact that trawling can have on the seabed uh, found that New Zealand's exclusive economic zone is a pri priority area for protection and that approximately 35% of our ocean territory is not already protected um, and is within the top 10% of the most important ocean carbon stocks. New Zealand's Environment Minister has said that he has opened to phasing out trawling in areas that, is, that are not already trawled. So it's a good response, but um, sort of the action that follows isn't yet clear. Um, Joanna Mossop, and her research um, on oceans policy um, has also indicated that uh, different marine management tools are also fragmented and disjointed, and there is a need to better connect the tools to manage activities um, and also incorporate climate change um, into the values uh, that, that feed into decision making for the seabed. Um, so 
with seabed sediment disturbance, it's a bit unclear as to, as to what is happening, but um, there sort of needs to be more research and better um, coordination around um, the different marine management tools in New Zealand. Uh, and this again could feed into an overarching blue carbon policy. And then finally, um, seaweed aquaculture. Um, while uh, seaweed isn't included in New Zealand's climate change policy, um, it is being industry that's being developed as part of New Zealand's aquaculture strategy. Um, and there is money going into researching um, carbon sequestration um, and the benefits um, of uh, kelp and mussel um, cultures in different areas of New Zealand. So this is a good start to gain an understanding for the potential, um, potential of, of seaweed blue carbon in New Zealand. Um, and the government has also um, sort of uh, really sponsored a report um, that has made a lot of recommendations around developing the, the aquaculture, seaweed aquaculture in New Zealand. Uh, so in this area, there's, um, there's potential for improvements and research to support this. Uh, and I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude. Um, so in conclusion, uh, there is a strong case uh, for uh, inclusion of blue carbon mitigation as part of New Zealand's uh, climate change policies, um, especially in Aotearoa, where we have uh, extensive coastlines and oceans, um, but it's currently being underrealized um, and lacks a connection between sort of the policies that are happening in different areas and New Zealand's overarching climate change policy. So my recommendation is that New Zealand should develop a blue carbon policy um, as part of its emissions reduction plan um, to show leadership in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Matty. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it is always interesting to see the uh, blue carbon debate in uh, the different con national context. And uh, yeah, it's, it's blue carbon is one of the nodes of the climate uh, biodiversity uh, nexus. Uh, so we will move to the next uh, presentation. Our next two speakers will talk about the emerging uh, marine cloud brightening technology. Blue carbon is kind of a bit climate mitigation approach with, uh, with uh, nature based, which is nature based, but uh, but uh, more and more uh, engineer, engineered uh, the solutions uh, to uh, addressing climate change is being developed and how can uh, regulations laws be, be uh, able to catch up and to respond to these uh, develop of development of the technologies is uh, very important now. Uh, so uh, we will first hear from uh, Ms. Rose Foster. Uh, she is a research assistant at the University of Queensland Center of Policy Futures. Through uh, the center, she, uh, she contributes to the reef restoration and adaptation programs uh, regulatory uh, sub-program. She completed, the, she completed her undergraduate studies with a dual Bachelor of Arts and Laws uh, on uh, University of Queensland in 2020 and hopes to undertake postgraduate study in environmental law in the future. Her current research investigates the capacity of legal frameworks to facilitate marine and coastal restoration. She has contributed to uh, recent research in this area in collaboration with the, uh, the Nature Conservancy. So the, the topic of her presentation is governing marine cloud brightening, uh, challenges and the recommendations. It is prepared by her and jointly with Nicole uh, Shumway and uh, Petro uh, Fieldman. Rose, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Julian. I'll just share my screen. Great, let me know if there's any issues with that. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking today, which are the Turbal and Yagara people, and acknowledge the elders past and present. Um, as Julian just said, uh, this paper was produced in collaboration with my colleagues, Nikki Shumway and Pedro Fiedelman, who are also online today. So 
This research forms part of a larger project examining the governance of various emerging technologies of the Anthropocene, which in addition to emissions reduction measures are being considered for conservation purposes to mitigate climate change impacts. So these technologies involve novel risks and uncertainties, which produce challenges for effective governance. Examining the governance of these technologies is particularly important since there may not be specific legislative frameworks in place to enable the assessment of these potential risks and the existing frameworks might not be equipped to manage the novel risks and uncertainties of these technologies. So today's presentation, as Julian said, focuses on marine cloud brightening, which is a techniques, technique that can be used to enhance cloud cover by spraying seawater particles into the atmosphere to reflect additional incoming solar radiation. So marine cloud brightening has been considered for application in a variety of contexts from the large to the local scale. And one potential conservation focused local application involves the temporary shading of coral reefs during bleaching conditions to attempt to reduce the effects of coral bleaching. So research into this small scale application is actually currently being undertaken in relation to the Great Barrier Reef and there were some field trials conducted in 2021. To place my presentation in the context of the conference themes, marine cloud brightening engages directly with this question of what can we do for nature? Since it involves potentially directly intervening in natural processes for the purpose of conserving ecosystems. So the question we sought to answer with our research was, if marine cloud brightening is something we can do for nature, then what else could we do to ensure that the assessment frameworks can adequately manage the novel risks and uncertainties accompanying it? So in the context of the progressing research into marine cloud brightening, we undertook a systematic literature review using the protocols that I've outlined on screen to investigate the governance challenges and recommendations for marine cloud brightening. So from that, we identified 26 publications uh, from which we identified 13 challenges and 13 recommendations. So to start with the challenges for governance, on the slide you can see I've included all of the challenges that we identified, which is quite an overwhelming uh, thing to look at. But we tried to bring those down into three broad themes, which are the technical challenges, authorization and democratic legitimacy challenges and ethical challenges. So many of these would be familiar to the emerging technologies context, reflecting that deficit of scientific information and the associated social and ethical issues that come along with that. So given the time constraint today, I won't speak through all of these. Um, I'll just focus on those three broader themes, but obviously I'm happy to discuss any of those individual challenges later on. So the technical challenges theme grouped together concerns about how decision making could manage the technical delivery of marine cloud brightening projects over time. Now, one challenge in this theme was uncertainty, which in this context refers to uncertainty about the technology's feasibility, its effectiveness, potential impacts that could be unintended or unexpected, and some other non-physical, ethical, political and scientific uncertainties. So uncertainty is challenging to navigate in a regulatory process, given that traditional risk assessment frameworks would seek to minimise risk. And if there's a lot of uncertainty, then those risks might be perceived as high. So under the next broad theme, we collated challenges that concerned who authorises the use and development of these technologies and whether those authorizations themselves are democratically legitimate. So this included, for example, the challenge of the potential transboundary effects of this technology, since marine cloud brightening impacts may cross jurisdictional boundaries. And so the people that are potentially impacted by deployment wouldn't be consulted in those decision-making processes. Um, the cross-jurisdictional impacts as well might enliven customary international law on transboundary harm. So that would have to be a substantial consideration in any decision-making framework. So the final theme collated challenges that engaged with the ethical dimensions of governing marine cloud brightening. So many of these challenges engage directly with this conference theme of responsibility. So some concerned whether we should even proceed with trialing or deploying these technologies at all. And if those were found to be ethically permissible, then how could we build ethical dimensions into the decision-making frameworks? 
So for example, the uh, intergenerational equity challenge acknowledges that future people will be profoundly dis affected by decisions to deploy or not to deploy these technologies. But of course, they don't get a direct say in the decision-making process. And it's also unclear to what extent we could build their concerns into the decision-making frameworks. So moving to the recommendations, again, we've got all of them up there on screen, but those three broader themes for recommendations are the governance characteristics, engagement and communication, and decision-making frameworks and risk assessment procedures. So there was a lot less consensus in the literature about these recommendations compared to the challenges. And so that included whether they could even effectively address the challenges. And then if they were, then which measures were preferable. So clearly no single recommendation is a panacea um, and marine cloud brining governance will warrant a policy mix to address those challenges I mentioned earlier. So moving to the governance characteristics theme, uh, this reflects that many publications identified particular standards or approaches that may be needed to manage those challenges. So, for example, this included international cooperation, which some papers suggested would be necessary prior to further research or even deployment. Though simultaneously, that recommendation was also criticised as potentially unachievable or unenforceable. As for the engagement and communication theme, this was comprised of recommendations that considered the extent to which and how broader society should be involved in those decision-making processes. So for example, stakeholder engagement was frequently championed as a recommendation, and it was commonly suggested that that should be implemented alongside pretty strict transparency requirements. So finally, several recommendations discussed the procedures that we implement around decision-making. So for example, the implementation of liability and compensation regimes to accompany other governance measures was identified as a potential way to manage that uncertainty about impacts. So this could try to reduce risk-taking behaviour and manage the losses incurred if there were impacts. So that's my pretty broad overview of the challenges and recommendations that we identified. And so from this, we identified three knowledge gaps in the literature, and these were in relation to the scale, um, to the context, and to the practical implementation of governing marine cloud writing. So the first of these knowledge gaps concerned the literature itself. So there were very limited results about marine cloud writing itself. Um, so accordingly, our review was primarily drawn from the literature on solar radiation management, which refers to technologies of varying scale and purpose that interfere with incoming solar radiation. And so that includes marine cloud brightening. But several types of this technology, and hopefully you can see a little bit from that diagram on the screen, um, are much on a much larger scale than marine cloud brightening. So marine cloud brightening is that one down the bottom. Um, so this means that the specific risks and impacts in a marine cloud writing context didn't factor into those challenges and recommendations as much as those planetary scale uh, applications did. So that scale could really affect whether those challenges or recommendations are applicable. So one example is the transboundary effects challenge. So if it's a local scale application, uh, these impacts might be contained in a small area. And so if there is no risk of transboundary impacts, that then follows on that it, there might not be as great a need for cross-jurisdictional uh, cooperation through international agreements. Uh, in saying that, the symbolic value of proceeding with research or deployment, even on a small scale, was noted in the literature of as supporting the desirability of some kind of international framework in relation to this. So the question of international cooperation might be a little more complex than just scale. Um, the next knowledge gap was in relation to the purpose or intention behind the technology's use. So further investigation might be needed into whether the appropriate challenges and best practice recommendations will work for a conservation context. 
So for example, in relation to the moral hazard challenge, which questions whether there's a risk that researching or deploying these technologies could come at the expense of emissions reduction measures. Um, the, if the intervention is framed as uh, something that's only done complementary to emissions reduction and for an explicitly conservationist purpose, then this challenge might be less significant for the governance recommendations. Um, whether that's the case, though, would also depend on those overarching governance measures and the political climate, because, of course, if these technologies were contemplated as a complete replacement for emissions reductions, then the challenge would still remain significant that this kind of technology could displace that. Um, other tech challenges that are affected by the conservation context specifically include those ethical challenges around privatisation and funding. So these might be more significant if the sites intended for protection were crown land or were really vulnerable ecosystems. So that might warrant greater public in, uh, oversight to ensure that those risk-taking behaviours are minimised. The final knowledge gap that we identified was in relation to the practical implementation of some of the recommendations. So, for example, one of the recommendations was that there should be proactive, ongoing and robust stakeholder engagement. Um, but there was quite limited detail about how we'd go about practically implementing this. So, for example, to implement it, we would probably want to identify exactly who would be involved in that engagement, since the impacts could be widespread, depending on scale. Uh, how they're involved, when they're involved, and how often they're involved, as well as how those engagements would actually feed back into those broader decision-making processes. So on that point of feeding back into decision-making, uh, reflexive governance was also a recommendation that would potentially benefit from greater practical examination. So implementing measures to monitor research and deployment and then adapting governance measures accordingly form key aspects of a reflexive regime. But for example, uh, the flexibility needed to implement that kind of thing may be challenging in a rigid legal context. So what are the implications of these uh, challenges and recommendations and those knowledge gaps for marine cloud brightening governance going forward? Well, despite the gaps in the research, the challenges that we identified will be a useful guide for governance issues that might arise as marine cloud brightening projects progress to trials and progress to deployment. And as those regulators begin to be asked to assess them. So as that research progresses, there will be a need to further investigate exactly how we manage these novel anthropocentric technologies from a regulatory perspective including in those specific contexts and in those specific scales, as I uh, mentioned earlier. So although that governance should be examined specifically with respect to marine cloud brightening, um, another uh, important source of information in designing this governance might be the governance of other emerging technologies, uh, particularly in conservation context. Uh, so marine cloud brightening shares many characteristics in common with these other emerging technologies, like the uncertainty and the risk, uh, just owing to the novelty. So when we're progressing towards the design of effective legislative frameworks, it might be possible to glean some lessons from those other frameworks for emerging technologies, uh, particularly if they have been implemented in a conservation context. So now that's it from me today. Um, I've popped my contact details up on screen and I'll look forward to hearing any of your comments or questions later. Thank you, Rose. You saved us uh, one minute. That's fantastic. And a very, very interesting uh, presentation that made me think of a report uh, published last year by the it's an effort led by the Aspen Institute from the US on a marine based uh, uh, carbon removal project it's a uh, like serves as a background paper for further development of a code of conduct uh, it, the technology they talk about is something more biological uh, based but it shares the same some characteristics uh, as to the uh, marine cloud brightening i, I think it's uh, yeah 
it's it's a very interesting. I have some questions, but we will save it to the to the uh, discussion. So our last uh, so thank thank you, Rose, again. Uh, our last speaker is Professor Jane McDonald. Uh, Jane is a, a professor of environmental and climate law at the University of Tasmania. As part of the Australian Forum of Climate Intervention uh, Governance, her current research exam examines the role of law in facilitating the development of technologies aimed at mitigating and adapting to the impacts of climate change and safeguarding against the risks that uh, such technologies pre present. So she will talk about uh, uh, governing the technologies of Anthropocene, marine cloud brightening on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the presentation is prepared by her jointly with uh, Carol Brent, Jeff McKee and uh, Menon Simon. So, uh, Jen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julian, and thanks to the uh, Macquarie Cell team for the opportunity to present again. I very much appreciate that. I'm joining you today from the unceded lands of the Moanina people of Lutrawita, Tasmania, and I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, when we submitted this abstract, which is uh, the, the early work from the team that's doing this work as part of a discovery project into the governance of solar radiation management. I have to say, I never for a moment imagined that there would be two presentations on marine cloud brightening. Uh, so I knew that Rose was going to be covering the broad challenges and I'm going to try in the course of this presentation to limit as much as possible the areas of overlap between our two presentations, but I wasn't sure until I heard Rose's presentation exactly what she was going to be presenting on. Um, our team is specifically interested in studying the governance of marine cloud brightening and the R&D program itself to determine some of those questions that Rose alluded to, whether it offers lessons for wider planetary scale solar radiation management, and then more broadly, some of the other environmental technologies of the Anthropocene. It's not to say that we don't care about the Great Barrier Reef and the specific application of these technologies for the Great Barrier Reef. It's more to recognize that the arrival of these new interventions is really part of a wider move towards more active sort of technological interventions, specifically to protect fragile ecosystems, to undertake restoration and so on. And then to reflect on whether our current approaches to governance are suited to this new phase, which acknowledging is still very much in the R&D phase in relation to marine cloud brightening. I think it's worth emphasizing that the Great Barrier Reef program is not being framed as a solar radiation management strategy in the pejorative sense of that term. The language that's used as part of the RRAP, the Reef Recovery, uh, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program is very much around adaptation. Uh, it's, it fits into this um, prevention uh, quind quindrant. Is there a, not a quadrant, but a quindrant? Um, as part of the cooling and shading program. And so recent critiques of solar radiation management, specifically the recent calls for a non-use agreement that's coming out of the Earth Systems Governance um, Scholarship that Nikki mentioned yesterday, uh, draws a distinction between solar radiation management and local adaptation strategies. And they specifically include marine cloud brightening as a local adaptation strategy with which they don't have concerns. Our view is that, and I think this fits nicely with the, the framing that, that Rose and Nikki and Pedro have put forward before me, that while there are obvious differences, particularly in relation to scale, uh, both temporal scale and geographical scale between marine cloud brightening and solar radiation management, there are sufficient similarities that it merits further investigation of whether the governance that we see emerging on the R&D of marine cloud brightening can offer lessons for solar radiation management. Although marine cloud brightening applications can occur at fairly local scales, 10 square kilometers, perhaps potentially 20 square kilometers for a single vessel. 
the RAP website itself suggests that one day, and they talk about a time horizon for the R&D of about 10 years, it could be used to cool the entire reef. So that's a 2000 kilometer long expanse, which might not be a planetary scale, but it's still a scale that deserves more scrutiny than uh, the assignment of it to a local adaptation strategy which is what the non-use agreement folk are, are characterizing it as. So I think that there's an interesting tension there. Um, in my abstract, I indicated that we're interested in considering particularly what anticipatory governance tells us about um, how marine cloud brightening and then solar radiation management should be governed. And it was great to see that um, uh, anticipatory governance was being captured in Rose's uh, identification of some of the governance priorities. We think it's not a standalone model, it's a useful complement to other governance frameworks like adaptive governance, like reflexive, reflexive governance and resilience thinking. Because it has its origins in science and technology studies. So one strand of anticipatory governance has been concerned specifically with the disruptive consequences of science and technological innovation, particularly around uh, nanotechnology. But there the focus of anticipatory governance is to manage the technologies while management is still possible. So before the technological genie is out of the bottle. And I think that that's particularly useful for this this particular set of technologies, establishing governance before the path dependencies um, limit governance or the technology gets to be un essentially ungovernable. There are other strands of anticipatory governance focusing on its flexibility, using a range of futures to prepare for change, to maximize future alternatives. They're all characterized by this future orientation and solar, re radi solar radiation management or solar geoengineering is regarded as an anticipatory challenge because at the moment, even its contours are not yet understood or, or knowable. So Gupta and others have recently produced this really interesting paper that this gr uh, graphic comes from that talks about how the content of governance and the context of anticipatory governance will be shaped by one's vision of the future. So if you see the future as more threatening when solar geoengineering is on the table, or in our case, marine cloud brightening is on the table, you're more likely to govern to restrict solar radiation management or to safeguard against risks. If you see the future as looking pretty bleak or less threatening with these technologies available to you, your governance at this stage will be focused on enabling and overseeing. And although this framework's focused on international solar geoengineering governance, I think it's a useful way of reflecting on what function the governance of marine cloud brightening might perform. It's certainly clear from the documents underpinning the marine cloud brightening program and the wider RRAP program for the Great Barrier Reef, that they regard the outlook for the reef as very dire without these interventions. So you can see the solid blue line here is on a very steep downward trajectory out to 2080 without any forms of intervention. This comes from modeling published last year about, well, what would each one of these different sorts of intervention, what, it, what effect would it have? And that modeling suggested that regional shading, marine cloud brightening, which is the light blue line on the left-hand side is the only single intervention that's likely to be effective over the next two decades. And that out to 2080 combined with enhanced crown of thorns control, thermally tolerant corals, that's the light blue line on the right-hand side. It's the only set of interventions that's gonna significantly improve uh, coral cover out to 2070. So in that context, the goal of anticipatory reef intervention governance is going to be to enable, but to oversee interventions that can assist. And that's where the sort of the, the interventions policy itself reveals from the start an appetite for such interventions. So the regulatory landscape in which the R&D for marine cloud brightening is focused 
is, is on regulating activities on the reef that might have a deleterious impact, but aren't specifically directed towards the reef itself, their tourism development, commercial wreck fishing, port infrastructure. It's the classic management to protect from exploitation. It doesn't really speak to this new category of intervention, which is interventions to help to do this active management. And so in addition to the permitting requirements for conducting research or undertaking other activities on the reef that we see already in place under the zoning framework, in 2020, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, Gabrumpa, issued this policy on Great Barrier Reef interventions and associated guidelines for the permit applications under that interventions policy. Strangely, the guidelines were released in 2018 and the policy came out in 2020, but they work together. It's really significant because it's the first policy in the world to speak to the governance of marine cloud brightening or anything approximating solar radiation management technologies. And I think it's likely that we'll see a comparable document being adapted and adopted to govern any kind of intervention we see over in Western Australia for Ningaloo Reef. And it can serve as a blueprint for managing marine cloud brightening and interventions for our other coral reef ecosystems around the world. And as I said, it starts from the premise that such activities are needed and then takes this stepped or incremental risk-based approach to approval. So intervention is encouraged where and when the anticipated conservation benefits to the reef outweigh associated risks. And that balance is undertaken, taking into account the need for the intervention, whether the reef would manage by itself, the high value of the reef, uh, anticipated benefits, as well as significantly the risks of inaction. So it's bringing into the risk calculus the, the fact that there might be risks of undertaking these interventions, but in some cases, those risks are much lower than the risk of doing nothing. It also recognises, though, that there are going to be classes of activity that are so high risk that at the moment they're not going to be countenanced. Interestingly, marine cloud brightening doesn't currently fall into that category. It's really things about you know, avoiding the, the repeat of the cane toad, uh, so introducing non-natives, uh, introducing pathogens uh, and some chemical processes. And particularly interesting there for a reef perspective is um, any kind of intervention aimed at producing localised phytoplankton blooms um, that might deal with carbon dioxide removal solutions. Uh, I think it's really interesting and I've highlighted here that the guidelines which were written before the policy actually used the term geoengineering, and that might have been unintentional and perhaps now regretted given the baggage that comes with that term. But what's interesting is that marine cloud brightening is not put into the highest risk category where the risk um, outweighs potential benefit. I think that they see that there is huge benefit. So my second last slide. So I'll just highlight here that a key feature of the policy is its strong focus on engagement with traditional owners of the reef and associated sea country, noting that the World Heritage listing for the Great Barrier Reef is both for its ecological and cultural values. So the policy promotes co-design of interventions and strong participation from traditional owners. And it's fair to say that the marine cloud brightening experiments that have occurred to date have had the involvement of traditional owners, although from the outside it's hard to see how that's actually occurred. But I think that in that, that having this provision in the policy means that RUMPA will look carefully at this issue when it's approving permits and when it's undertaking interventions in its own right. And it's a provision that perhaps would have helped the Harvard Scopex experiment folk uh, in their failed attempts to do some small scale field experiments in the north of Sweden, the addition from the indigenous Sami people. Uh, I suspect that there were bigger concerns at play there to do with the fact that that stratospheric aerosol injection, um, which I'm happy to talk about in questions. So we think that the interventions policy is a good start, 
but it probably fails on some aspects of anticipatory governance. It does start from a consultative foresighting process in the form of the Reef Outlook reports and the 2050 documents. But at the moment, at least, I think that there is um, not much in the way of further and that thing that Rose highlighted as well. It appears to take so far a fairly limited of who the public is. And at the moment, there's, I think, a problem with transparency. There's not a lot of information available. There are unanswered questions about IP, which Rose alluded to, so I won't go into those in more detail. Happy to take questions on that. But it's not an insignificant question. Uh, there, there are, I think, two, I think, key priorities for this R&D phase. The first is to agree on some exit points, thresholds that determine that the research just shouldn't continue any further. And finally, during this R&D stage, there needs to be the beginnings of consultation on the governance arrangements that should be put in place for deployment. This is something that Rose alluded to as well, but we need to make sure that this is happening so that we don't end up with lock-in, we don't end up with a presumption that the regime that's in place at the moment is the one that's best for both marine cloud brightening and any further upscaling that we see in the future. Thank you, Jane. I think my network just jumped. I missed the, the, your last sentence, but yeah, thank thank you so much for the uh, presentation. I think I have a better understanding now on the scale of the application of this technology. And uh, uh, thank you for your thoughts on uh, the uh, how can the regulatory uh, framework catching up the the development of technology. So we are now going to the the discussion part. I see questions that are mostly directing to the first two uh, presentations. I think questions on the uh, uh, marine cloud brightening is coming coming soon. But I, I will ask the first question is to Ethan. Uh, the question is, uh, establishing MPA can be easier than enhanced enforcement measured to be constantly undertaken to prevent poaching by IUU features. Besides the application available tech, uh, application of available technologies, how does Australia engage in physical enforcement? What solution do you have for uh, small and poor island nations to protect their MPAs? Uh, Ethan. Thanks for the question. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I My research focused a lot on the implementation of MPAs and how that was done rather than ongoing management. Um, but I did uh, come across some research that's been done about Australia's um, Antarctic uh, territories, so the Heard and McDonnell Islands, um, where they have some MPAs. And um, the research suggested that stakeholder management was one of the key um, ways that this was actually enforced. And it was a bit to do with the fact that it's so far removed from everything else. So um, there was only a couple of fishing uh, companies that operated in that area, but they were kind of brought on board throughout the whole process of the MPA designation and consulted. And then they are relied upon to do the um, monitoring and, and things like that and setting limits um, on their catch. And I think that that's something that could be done more. Um, especially with Australia's other MPAs, which have been um, uh, partly derailed by a lack of consultation. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that in 2013, there was that review of Australia's MPAs and it was actually driven by, um, uh, reportedly anyway, uh, some fisheries lobby lobbyists, um, which kind of took advantage of uh, uh, recreational fishers and, um, created a sentiment against um, MPAs, the new MPA network, even though most of them wouldn't be affecting any sort of recreational fishers. Um, but I think there was probably a disconnect there between these fisheries uh, lobbyists and um, the design of the MPAs. So um, yeah, I think uh, 
Australia is not really a model um, for this sort of thing, I don't think. Um, if I didn't emphasize that enough in my presentation. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, maybe stakeholder management is a good um, starting point uh, for enforcing MPAs. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, next question is uh, directing to uh, to Madeline. So the question is, uh, how are the blue carbon policy implemented in combating the bad impacts of climate change in New Zealand? And secondly, how does New Zealand uh, encourage the local community to participate in the conservation of wetland? Because wetland is one place as one place of carbon sink. Uh, I have one additional question for uh, Maddie. It's about how, how do you see the role of blue carbon in the uh, New Zealand New Zealand's uh, climate policy? Do you see it as a part of uh, the tradable carbon credits, or it just to be um, nationally managed in the the carbon uh, inventory of the the states? Yeah. Med med Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I'll start. I'll start in order. So, um, how are uh, blue carbon policies being implemented? Uh, so currently, no blue carbon policies in New Zealand, um, and not very strong climate change policies in general. Uh, so hopefully, with the new emissions reduction plan, that will change for New Zealand. But currently, it seems like the focus very much will be on uh, land-based uh, mitigation. Um, so you know, use of electric vehicles, um, decarbonising freight and transport decarbonizing the energy system etc so blue carbon doesn't really play a part in New Zealand's policy so um, yeah, my recommendations are that it should play a part obviously um, there are uh, big areas where there's more emissions and um, they should be targeted first but blue carbon can form a part of the wider mitigation policies for New Zealand in terms of how New Zealand encourages the local community to participate in um, conservation of wetlands, um, I'd say it happens in pockets. There are um, some pretty active uh, conservation groups in various pockets um, that uh, work to restore and, and support wetlands. And some of them do so in collaboration with, um, with iwi and with, with government par uh, partners as well. Uh, so yeah, it's happening in pockets and I'd say that you know the government encourages it, but um, yeah, it really comes at the initiative of the community. I know there's one um, from where I'm from in Nelson, uh, there's one community group that's actually measuring samples of um, so it's sort of the uh, carbon cores and, and wetlands. So they've just started doing that, which is really exciting. So in pockets, I would say. Um, and then the final question from you, Julian, uh, I guess related to um, sort of how the policy, you know, how that would feed into New Zealand's greenhouse gas inventory and carbon credits. Um, there's definitely space and there's a lot of work out there um, being done in terms of how we use blue carbon and, and, and carbon uh, for carbon credits uh, in New Zealand, it's not happening at the moment, but I think that that's a space that could definitely be explored. Um, and I think for New Zealand to really um, implement blue carbon in its climate change policies, I think the focus needs to be on, on measuring uh, so that we know sort of the, the flows of carbon in blue carbon environments um, to really justify uh, why are we putting attention into this into this space? But that needs a lot of investment into into research and development in that space. I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Okay, I have a, another question for for Ethan. Uh, it's from Sri Watini from the Faculty of Law, University Islam, Indonesia. Uh, he wants to ask uh, questions that uh, MPA as an important uh, program to conserve marine biodiversity, UNCLOS, and also Biodiversity Convention, CBD, as the legal basis to establish MPAs as, as the legal obligations of the parties. Based on the research that Australia would establish 45% MPAs in the future as the implementation of the international law into national level. I would like to know further what kind of policy in establishing 
MPA due to the impact of climate change in marine environment and uh, marine bio biodiversity. Uh, Ethan. Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Sri. Um, yeah, I I think this uh, this made me think of um, the BBNJ negotiations, which are um, negotiations for a uh, treaty for high seas biodiversity conservation, um, because uh, area based management tools and uh, marine protected areas in uh, particular are envisioned as a big part of that instrument. Um, and the connection with climate change is actually that these, these negotiations so far have largely avoided um, addressing anything to do with climate. Um, and I think that's uh, a big hole in um, the process, but, but states have been very keen to separate the climate away from um, anything to do with biodiversity in, this, in these negotiations. Um, and so uh, when it comes to MPAs, there's actually been some suggestion that we might be better off with a more dynamic system of spatial management in the oceans um, rather than, than static MPAs, which are quite uh, old school when it comes to marine management. It might be better for there to be um, uh, this dynamic spatial management, which uh, addresses changes in the, in the ocean due to climate change. Um, and so I think that that's probably an interesting um, dynamic to explore, but also um, all of the other panelists uh, spoke on uh, climate initiatives. So maybe they have something to add when it comes to climate um, and ocean protection. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, there's a question to Rose and Jane. Uh, the question is uh, anticipatory governance. Uh, do you think it has a problem in federal system? Um, I think Jan might have looked at this in a little bit more detail than me. Um, but I think, so she may have a better answer than I do. Um, I guess it's a pretty broad term. Um, I think it would have to be integrated with other things like polycentric governance. So especially if it's for something like the Great Barrier Reef, there's going to have to be some kind of federal involvement. Um, but yeah, I think perhaps Jen might have a better answer for this one. Uh, yes, thanks for the question, Jennifer. I'm not quite sure what you had in mind. And it's a shame that we're not in a live context where I can say, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Um, I, I suppose my response would be that anticipatory governance is more a sort of an approach to governing rather than specifying particular prescriptions. And so it, it has, it's going to be challenging to the extent that federal government, state government and local government might have different conceptions of the future. And so to the extent that anticipatory governance is particularly concerned about um, you know, keeping, maintaining flexibility and generating options for future governance under various scenarios. Um, when you have federal structures, that might be more problematic. But I don't think that it's, I, I'm not sure that it's federal systems that will be particularly problematic there. I think that it's probably that you have um, very disparate views of what the future is and different value sets around um, how the various threats and opportunities that are posed by that. Um, so, yes, I, I wish I could have the conversation with you because I'm just not quite sure why, you know, what was particularly concerning or, or interesting about the federal structures. For me, what's interesting, though, in relation to the GBR governance is that, um, yes, the Great Barrier Reef is off the coast of Queensland, but it is governed as if it is, as if Queensland is the only uh, group of people that are concerned about it. The federal government represents everybody else, but the specifics of governance seem to be very much based in far North Queensland. And I, I find that really interesting when it attracts um, so much national attention and is in the hearts of so many Australians. 
So I think that that's a really interesting question from the point of view of its World Heritage listing. Uh, thank you, Rose and Jane. Uh, I have a question about the uh, multi-stakeholder consultation of this kind of technology. Uh, what do you think is the best time to uh, start this kind of consultation? Because if the options are not clear, uh, it is very difficult for discussion. So do you think it, you need to wait for the technological options are quite mature and start the consultation or you think it needs to start in the, in the very early stage? Thank you. Um, yeah, my answer would be that yes, it, it probably needs to start right from the start, but um, there's a balance to be struck there, right? Because of course at the, at the beginning there would be, as I spoke about in some depth, quite a lot of uncertainty around what any kind of use or deployment of these technologies would look like. So um, there's a risk, I guess, that engaging early could uh, have some perverse effects on whether it would even progress at all. Uh, but simultaneously, it would certainly be important to get people involved right from those early stages and make them a part of that process. And, and that's very much what uh, came up in the literature that should begin from the start, ensure people are engaged in the full process and that we would be constantly going back and forth uh, with those stakeholders as decisions are made. Uh, thank you, Rose. Uh, and uh, I, I would also encourage panelists to ask each other questions because uh, Jane, Jane and Rose, you have been working on the same topic. If you have questions to each other, you can also ask. I guess I'd love to make a comment to say it's it's nice to see that um, having looked at a lot of this on a on a broader scale and just generally looking at marine collaborating, it's it's nice to see that those challenges and recommendations we identified were actually coming up in um, that practical application on the reef. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of time, Julian, so I'm, I'm going to stay quiet. <laughs> Julian, I think you're on mute. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ethan. I think uh, I'm greatly appreciate today's uh, presentation because I'm personally, I have always been interested in the connections between ocean conservation and uh, the uh, climate change. And uh, I always thought the uh, marine clouds threatening is kind of a mitigation geoengineering, but today's presentation uh, enlightened me that it can be a, a, at a small scale, it can be a part of the adaptation uh, measured. And I think uh, look at the national uh, the discussion on the climate and the conservation uh, and the biodiversity nexus, it's, it's more, uh, the discussion is more vivid at the international forest. Look at the connections in the uh, domestic policies. Uh, for example, in, in Germany and in China, I look at the policies on how the pol uh, climate policy addressing ocean issues and how the ocean issues addressing climate issues, it's still very uh, disconnected. Uh, although there are many studies, but at the policy level, there are uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work to do. I think uh, the discussions, such as our, our today's discussion, would be very helpful to inform those uh, developments. So uh, once again, I, I want to thank our uh, uh, great panelists and uh, thank the audience. Thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to see you in the future.